Okay guys, welcome to a, another installment of video lecture series. Uh, today we started anatomy physiology and I kind of just wanted to put a video lecture out just to kind of review some of the things that we talked about today in class, just to kind of reinforce things. So let's talk about it. Um, So we, we defined anatomy as a study of the body structures. Where, where is it, right? And we talked about physiology, meaning how does it work. We kind of used the example of the car, speaking uh, specifically about the carburetor. Yeah, where is the carburetor would be like the anatomy. But how the carburetor works, well, that's more the physiology behind it. anatomical position. Uh, we talked about that today and we talked about why we have it, right? Um, we have to have something to be used as a point of reference for describing the location of body structures. Um, when we talk about anatomical position though, specifically, uh, that's going to be standing with the arms down at the side of the palms facing forward like the picture shows here. That's the anatomical position. We talk, took a little while to talk about the terms. Uh, we talked about supine, prone, lateral. Now that should be lateral, like lateral recumbent. Fat, well, yeah. There is a lateral come. Maybe maybe we're talking about the lateral in the position. But anyway, we'll get to it. Fowler's position, semi Fowler's in the shock position. Here in the top picture, we have the supine position, and then we have the prone position. Doesn't matter, you know, which way the head's turned, like we talked about in class, left or right. Uh, the patient's more or less on his stomach, being in the prone position. Now we talk about the lateral recumbent position. In this, in this sense, lateral is going to mean on the side. So we see that we have left or right lateral recumbent. Remember, when we talk about left or right to the patient, it's going to be the patient's left and the patient's right. So a lot of times that's going to be opposite of how you're, because when you face them, okay, your left arm is actually going to be the right side. So that's how we refer to it as the patient's right and the patient's left. Here again, Fowler's position, it's a 45 degree angle, um, and it's, so that's what we have here. Uh, if you want semi Fowler's, well, we're going to, going to uh, we're going to reduce that angle. Okay, so we're going to actually, actually lean the head of that stretcher back some more. That would be a semi Fowler's position. And the shock position we talked about, we no longer really use this, but we do talk about it because it could still be out there. Um, we don't use it because of manipulation of the spine and trauma patients. Now, non-trauma patients, fine. Throw their feet up like that's fine. It's a good treatment for someone who is uh, hypotensive, meaning that blood pressure is low. Oops. And then we talked about some directional terms. We talked about anterior and posterior. And basically anterior means front, posterior means back. And we compared those terms to dorsal and ventral. Dorsal meaning back and we talked about dorsal, think about the dorsal fin and the ventral position meaning the front position. Uh, more than less we talked about that's mostly used in animal physiology and not so much uh, in human anatomy and physiology, but the terms are out there, so we tell you about them. Superior and inferior. Uh, during, during the gallery session today, I'm pretty much sure people using those terms correctly. I mean, it, kind of simple when you think about superior being 
maybe your supervisor or something like that, and inferior meaning below that. And then we have medial and lateral. And so we had actually talked about that and proximal and distal. And so medial, we show here, I think you can see my arrow on the video, medial meaning toward the midline. And we talked about the midline today, that imaginary line that, that comes down uh, uh, right across the patient that makes equal sides right or left. And then we talked about lateral be, meaning away from that imaginary midline. And then, of course, there's superior on top, inferior on the bottom. We talked about um, we talked about proximal and distal, and here we have a a pretty good slide explaining that proximal meaning closer to the midline or closer to the trunk uh, than something else that you've referenced. Another reference point, so meaning. <clears throat> Uh, meaning the uh, knee is proximal to the ankle using those two landmarks. The knee obviously closer to the trunk than the ankle. Uh, the shoulder being more proximal to the trunk than the wrist. And so we kind of use proximal and distal together. Uh, distal meaning away from that proximity point that you're using. So the shoulder, I'm sorry, so the wrist is definitely distal to the shoulder. Here we have a picture of that imaginary midline again and we talk about um, medial and lateral again. Um, we show Palmer here. We talked about the planter being the sole of the foot and we talked about that plant. Uh, we use that kind of like with the planter's reflex. We talked about how if someone said planter's reflex, it, obviously it's going to refer to the foot. We talked about the planes and we said the sagittal plane is a vertical plane that separates right and left halves. Um, and then we said that the sagittal plane could be an unequal section and the mid-sagittal plane is equal. And we said that, you know, this, these are basically used um, for imaging, like CT scans, x-rays, things like that. If we wanted to get a sagittal view, um, then we would actually move something uh, to where we could get a picture of right and left. And then we said that the mid-sagittal plane, the one that's equal, really corresponds with that imaginary midline. And you can look at this picture and clearly see that this line right here is definitely the midline. Uh, we talked about the frontal plane and uh, you'll see here that it divides the body into front and back halves and right there. So we have the front half that we're seeing here and of course on the other side would be the back. Then we talked about the transverse plane, okay, and we talked about how it shows the liver, stomach, and spleen, and we actually got this picture here to try to, to show that, and then the next picture here referencing that. So there's other pictures too. Somebody said the navel, and yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that, but it's, I think it's actually going to be higher than the navel. Um, uh, if you Google it or something, you'll see it looks like it's above the navel, but we just need to know that how, how that it splits like that and how that obviously you could be able to see those organs that I talked about. Okay, you, you're clear in this view. You, could, you would be able to see the liver, the spleen, and the stomach. All right, so then we talked about the mid-axillary line. So here we have the mid-axillary line. It's in the middle of the armpit down to the ankle. 
and I can rotate this person around 360 degrees and this line is not going to move. It's always going to be just like this. And I, and I, you know, again, I reminded everyone that we use things like the midline, we use the uh, mid axillary line as lines of reference. Okay, well, you know, I talked about uh, maybe having to describe the location of something, um, and I actually mentioned the left lateral chest or right lateral chest um, as, a, as something that you could use these marks for. In uh, paramedic school, we use a mid axillary line um, as a point of reference along with the second to third intercostal space, and those are spaces in between the second and third rib uh, when we actually do uh, needle decompressions when we're putting a needle in to reduce the amount of pressure inside the chest caused from a pneumothorax. And here we have the abdominal quadrants. And I talked about the organs here. We haven't really went into detail about these organs yet, but it is important that we know the organs in these quadrants. Uh, it will become, we will use this information throughout the class when we're talking about injuries. Uh, so, you know, we need to know that if a patient has tenderness to the right upper quadrant, uh, what organs could be involved in that? And obviously here we can see the liver is a majority of the livers in this quadrant. Um, the colon, the pancreas, and the small intestine, and posterior to those organs is the right kidney. Um, we can look in the left upper quadrant and we can uh, know that a small portion of the liver is there along with the spleen. Um, and that's important because the spleen, spleen injuries are common and they can be devastating. Uh, posterior to those organs is the left kidney, the stomach, the colon, the pancreas, and the small intestine. Uh, continuing down to the left lower quadrant, we can see the colon, small intestine, the left ureter, and that's part of the anatomy of the kidney, the left ovary in females, and left fallopian tube in females. And I don't remember talking about the right lower quadrant. Um, we have the colon, small intestines, again, the right ureter, uh, uh, anatomy of the kidney, the appendix, and I've had a couple questions today about the function of the appendix, and to be quite honest, I'm sure that we could probably look something up um, and find some type of function, but science is de it debates this uh, quite regularly about what the function of the appendix is. And you know, some people, uh, some folks have suggested that the appendix, the function of that is, is <clears throat> to remove waste products. But uh, from what I've read, um, it's just, it's really unknown. Um, but we do know it causes problems, right? Especially in uh, folks uh, usually around the age, uh, around 17 and younger, um, usually sometime in the early teen years, um, it becomes inflamed and has to be removed. The right ovary in the female patient and the right fallopian tube in the female patient. Here's a better, I say better, a different view maybe of these quadrants. Here's your liver. I don't think we had a really good view of the gallbladder on the last uh, slide. Here the gallbladder, uh, just um, inferior to the liver, kind of hides up underneath it. You would actually have to fold that liver up a little bit to be able to see it. Um, we have the duodenum here. Um, and its function is to kind of work with the stomach to, to uh, digest food. Right kidney, uh, it's covered up, so it's hard to see. It's posterior to all these, all these organs, so on the posterior or back side. The transverse colon, okay, part of your large intestine. And your right adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney and it's not really in view. <clears throat> so here we have uh, part of your small intestine and your right upper quadrant as well. If we come down to that right lower quadrant again, you could see 
Some of the large intestine coming down here, the cecum, the appendix, and the appendix is hid underneath some of these, uh, underneath the intestines. Uh, the right ureter the, is, is hid, and so we can't really, don't have a really good view of that. If we go to the left up, whoa, sorry, left upper quadrant, we see that other part of the liver. We see that um, the stomach is here, okay, and the, a large majority of the stomach is in that left upper quadrant. We have our transverse colon, just, this, it, and just like we do in the other quadrant, in the right upper quadrant. Um, small intestine. Here's your landmark uh, for your belly button. All right, and then in your left lower quadrant, we start to pick up the small intestine. Here uh, we have that large intestine part coming down. We have your, it's also you know, changes names into your sigmoid colon. Don't worry about that. Don't care really that you know that. Again, we show a picture now of the of the planter and the palmer. Okay, so the palmer, pretty pretty easy to remember the palm, right? Palm of your hand, palmer. Planter, uh, I think about planting seeds too, and people walking like a planter's foot. Sometimes you you'll hear it called that. And then we went to the muscular skeletal. And uh, we talked about the functions of the muscular skeletal system. Um, we talked about protection um, yeah, of the body's organs. We talked about it given the body its shape. We talked about function of being able to produce blood cells in the bone marrow. So it's pretty interesting. And then we talked about, obviously, about the movement that the skeletal system gives us. So we know the skeletal system provides that movement, but we also talked about um, skeletal muscle. And that's how you can kind of remember that skeletal muscle goes right along with the functions of the skeletal system, which is movement, voluntary movement. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then we went to talk more about the skull. And we pointed out some things. We pointed out the frontal bone, you know, right here at your forehead. We talked about the orbital that surrounds the eyes, okay? And orbital fractures are, you know, they're quite common too. They're very painful. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's your orbital. We talked about the maxilla being the upper part of the jaw. We talked about your parietal bone being right here on the side of the skull. Yeah, your temporal bone, I think somebody mentioned that in class, it's a little lower. Here's your parietal. We talked about the occipital. And we, we know that is the back of the skull. The occipital part right here is the blue area. That's the occipital. All right, these are called, these marks up here, these are what they refer to as sutures. You don't have to know those. You don't have to know any of this other stuff that's up here, like the sagittal sutures. All right, the lamboid suture, don't worry about any of that. We're good. We then went to, hang on one second, let me just, I want to look real quick. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, good. We're, we're okay. We're talking about now the spinal column from superior being top to inferior 
to the bottom. We need to know the order of these. Um, we talked about the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral. We had this uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner type acronym to help kind of keep up the, with the number. So we know that breakfast is at seven, so we have seven cervical. We have lunch at 12 for 12 thoracic vertebrae. We have five at dinner at five, five lumbar vertebrae. And then we talked about the five fused sacral and the three to five fused coccyx. We talked about the sacral part of the spine, this fused part right here makes up the posterior part of your pelvis. If you guys give me just a second, I'm going to see if I have a better picture to show you guys of the pelvis here. Give me just a second to look real quick. I thought I might have a better picture. This one might be pretty good. Let me look at it real quick. Uh, if I can make it bigger, I think I can. A little too big. Okay, so here, um, that might, I don't know, it's a little better maybe. So here, we have the ilium. Okay, um, this is called like an iliac crest, where it, it where the it's kind of more or less the very top part of the ilium. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find some stuff that might be important. Here is your coccyx part of your spine down here, and this was the sacrum part of your spine that grows out and kind of grows into the pelvis. Let me see if I have any, but anything better. Let's see. think I really have anything and nah, it's too much better than that one but that kind of this kind of like I think this does actually a pretty good job of um, you know showing it here's your ischium the part right here that kind of comes down it's purple so we have lots of bones, right, that make up the pelvis, and that's one. And, and they're large bones, and usually the large bones that break are the ones that bleed the most. We talked about the pelvis. You know, you can use, uh, lose your whole blood volume from a pelvic fracture, and we talked about the next bone being uh, the femur, the large. You know, the, it's a large bone in your leg, and how that it's a dangerous bone to break because of blood loss. We talked about the irregular shaped bones and they're called vertebrae. Um, here is your vertebral body. Uh, don't worry about, don't worry about, just know that this is a vertebrae. You're not going to have to break this down. Uh, you can see the spinal cord that kind of comes through here. That's, its function is to protect that spinal cord. Uh, here you see the disc. And that's where we talked about that intervertebral disc, and how um, and and how when it gets wore out and gets thin, that it's called degenerative disc disease. And so yeah, so we can look at that. I'm just showing this for reference, just so you can kind of get an idea. Uh, bounded by the strong ligaments. And 
it's um, if it becomes crushed or displaced, the spinal cord housed inside the spinal column can be squeezed, stretched, torn, or severed. That's how, that's kind of it's it's good to know because this is how you folks that have spinal injuries is how it happens. I mean, not every spinal cord that's injured is severed, and not every person that has paralysis or they're unable to move their legs from a accident remains that way if it if it uh, it's just if it's squeezed then uh, um, and it can be squeezed by a lot of things like swelling and that sort of thing and the swelling is reduced then everything kind of returns back to normal or close to normal and as it heals it just gets better uh, but then there are those that that actually are uh, torn or severed and here's a picture of the degenerative disc and you can compare these two discs this is the top one right here is a healthy disc followed by the one on the next one you can see how much thinner it is and someone with some very good eyes in class today mentioned how irregular that the um, vertebrae looked right here and I think that was the author's uh, way of trying to show inflammation and it probably is a lot of arth arth arthritic bone here this kind of sticking out looks kind of ugly but yeah causes a lot of pain then we talked about the thorax and in the thorax we mentioned that we have in the middle here your breastbone aka and that's where it, it's aka breastbone but we like to talk about it as your sternum Okay, we talked about your xiphoid process, and it because it's a process because this bone comes out into a point. And they like to call points and stuff like that processes. Um, your super sternal notch up here on top, and that becomes important in respiratory because we can see that notch sucking in, and we know that that's a sign of respiratory distress. We have your clavicles up here, your collarbones. We've got your ribs. We know if we have someone with well, you know, ribs 9 through 12. Let's say 12 down your floating ribs. Wow, well, 11 and 12. 9 and 10. Okay, so we can look back up at a previous slide. And find it. And we know that that the liver lies in here. I hear it. And so if we have tenderness around that rib cage, it might be a little more than a fractured rib. We might have some problems here with the abdominal organs. It's something to think about when we're assessing patients. We'll get more about that into trauma and even medical assessments. Then we talked about the lower extremities. Um, Want to revisit a couple of these? I'd like to revisit the patella down here because you could see real good on the slide today. It's that triangle-looking part of your bone. Common for injuries, and if you fall on your knee, that's what you're going to get. You're going to hit that one first usually, and that's why it it fractures so much. It's just in a yeah you know, bad location, I guess, for for injuries. And then we come down here, we talked about the, the calcaneus being your heel, and those, that is a bone, and it does fracture. And then going to the upper extremities, we talked about the cubital, meaning of the elbow or forearm, and how that's a dislocation. We 
talked about the carpal beat meaning the wrist. We didn't really cover the joints, and I'm really not going to. I think you should know them. It's any of the stuff you could run into on a National Registry exam. And then we talked about the blood supply of the bone. You know, bone is living tissue. It's, it needs to be oxygenated. And blood carries oxygen, so it has to have its it has to have it. And so you see here that you can see in the middle here of your it's called the marrow cavity and this is where that blood supply lives. And the larger the bone the more blood supply obviously. The femur fracture 1,000, 2,000 milliliters okay 1 to 2 liters. Uh, pelvis fracture yeah, depending on your blood volume, that's all of it. Seven to eight, a little less um, in some folks, but yeah, that's almost your. That is your entire blood volume um, from a fracture. So that's how devastating a pelvis fracture can be. We talked about the types of muscle. We talked about skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. We said that skeletal muscle is always voluntary muscle, even if you lose the ability to walk. Um, it's still voluntary muscle. We looked at cardiac and smooth muscle. We identified both as involuntary. We differentiated the two by cardiac muscle having automaticity, that electrical uh, system of its own. Uh, and we talked about smooth muscle uh, living uh, in the organs and intestines, bronchioles and having the ability to cause uh, blood vessels to constrict or become dilated. And then we looked at these vessels here. We looked at a normal vessel and we compared that with one that was vasoconstricted by the smooth muscle. And here's another smooth muscle that's actually relaxed. We talked about what would cause something like this. Bleeding, hemorrhaging would cause vasoconstriction. And vaso, I like what they call it, vasodilation. Sounds pretty cool, but either one. Uh, when this happens, it's usually from uh, the body overreacting to uh, an antigen or due to some type of spinal injury, uh, spinal shock is like what we call it. And then we stopped at the respiratory system. You guys are going to do that Monday. I will probably put another video out at that time to, to just kind of um, re-emphasize that a little bit too. Uh, my Brady, I'm going, you know, I'm going to try to get something assigned on my Brady. Maybe I'll try to get it done this weekend. If not, we'll get it Monday. Um, we're going to be in this chapter for a while, so we have some time. All right, uh, study this weekend. Um, we're in, we're in uh, chapter seven and eight. We're in the danger zone. Um, so I need your, I need you uh, to be at your best. So I need a weekend of really reading and studying. Um, families out there, thank you, thank you for your uh, help in in this process. Uh, I hope if you're listening to me right now you can hear me thanking you um help them out they need it it's going to be a challenging three or four weeks um we're fixing this is just the tip of it this is really what we're talk, just kind of talking about is it's nothing compared to the respiratory system we're going to talk about gas exchange we're going to talk about co2 o2 how the diaphragm contracts chemoreceptors baroreceptors the brain and how it figures this stuff out um, it's it's going to be this is where it's going to get hard when we get into this because sometimes it's hard to see this in your head um, so thank you for helping them thank you for being patient we'll get them done and get them back to you soon have a great weekend